Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 16004 in the name of Stuart McMillan on Scottish Tourism Month 2019. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Stuart McMillan to open the debate. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, first of all, I'd like to thank every member who has signed uh, the motion to allow this debate to take place today. I am delighted to be leading this debate as a, I am a member of the Parliament's Culture, Tourism Europe and External Affairs Committee, as well as uh, convening both the tourism and the recreational boating and marine tourism cross-party groups. Members will have heard the phrase that tourism is everyone's business. It's not just a catchy soundbite, it's a fact. Now, whether it's the Solheim Cup it taking place in Fife later this year, or the recent European Indoor Athletics Championships in Glasgow, or to the rugby tourism that happens every year with the Six Nations, and also the Autumn Tests, and to the many, many local Highland Games across the nation, tourism plays a huge part in the success of these major events. Now, there are also the, the million and one tourism opportunities across the nation that entice people to actually see them, including, in your own constituency, presenting officer, the Thurlstein Castle in Lauderdale, uh, as well as the Tempest Brewing Company in Gala Shields, and also in uh, Emma Harper's uh, region, the heads of Air Farm uh, down in Air. Uh, it's, uh, certainly, there's something there for children of all sizes and, and ages. And also in uh, Gillian Martin's constituency, in, uh, Glen uh, Geary, and hopefully I've pronounced that properly, um, which is uh, Scotland's most easterly distillery. Uh, the reason why I mentioned Emma, uh, Emma Harper and Jelly Martins, because I knew also they were speaking uh, on behalf of the, the SNP group. Uh, then, of course, there is the, the wonderful Linlithgow constituency of the Cabinet Secretary uh, for a visit to Linlithgow Palace or the Linlithgow Canal Centre. Uh, our, <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> our, country, our country has tourism offers in abundance. It really has something for everyone. Now, I particularly like the comment from the Chair of Visit Scotland, that Lord uh, John Thurso, uh, when he stated, Scotland for me is a land of innovation based on our glorious traditions. Both sides of that are important. We should celebrate our heritage of kilts, shortbread and heather, along with our educational strengths and our inventiveness. Now, I couldn't agree more. Now, my motion uh, highlights March as being Scottish uh, Tourism Month, organised by the Scottish Tourism Alliance. And I warmly welcome this excellent initiative as it highlights many things. Firstly, the celebration of what tourism brings to the nation and also to local communities. And also, secondly, making more people in the nation and elsewhere appreciate what we actually have to offer. Now, Scotland may be a nation small in size, but we more than make up for that in stature when it comes to our many USPs and what we have actually given the world. Now, I want to thank the, the STA for their excellent efforts and work that they do all year round to promote Scotland as a tourism destination. I'd also like to highlight uh, the recent uh, Sail Scotland uh, Marine Tourism Conference in the wonderful Beacon Arts Centre in my own Greenock and Inverclyde constituency. The conference returned to Inverclyde and the location was very much fitting. Marine tourism plays a growing role in the tourism economy and the work of our cross-party group in helping deliver the first marine tourism strategy is something that I am immensely proud of. With only a, a small part uh, of our country having a border, but the rest of the country being surrounded by water, then there, there really was a, a glaring opportunity to be worked on, and, uh, and this is now bearing fruit. Now, the absolute uh, shameless plug that I'm about to offer from one constituency uh, could go on all night, but uh, I'll, just, I'll highlight just two examples. Inverclyde is Scotland's marine tourism capital. Now, whether it's recreational boating, we've got the Kip Marina is the home of Scotland's boat show in October, uh, <clears throat> or the growing number of cruise liners arriving, then we are delivering more every year. Now, when the, the new cruise ship visitor centre opened in Greenock, uh, it will include some of the works of the late, iconic George Wiley, who lived in Gourock. Uh, the, the even bigger opportunity with cruise tourism would be for more ships to actually use Greenock as a departure point, therefore encouraging more hotels to actually open up within the, the Greenock and Inverclyde constituency. And this was actually touched upon in an article in yesterday's Greenock Telegraph, as there is a, a, an operator looking to, in, to invest in Inverclyde. The second example uh, is uh, this important year and the history and the legacy of one of Scotland's greatest sons, and that's James Watt. The Cabinet Secretary will be very much aware of my efforts to create a, a James Watt festival uh, in this, the bicentenary of the death of James Watt. What is a gift from Greenock to the world? The Maclean Museum is to be re renamed the Watt Institution. 
and that will be reopening this year after its refurbishment, part funded by Historic Environment Scotland as well as Inverclyde Council. And today I was delighted to, to hear that the, the James Watt commemorative tartan has now been agreed by the Scottish Registers of Tartans. Presenting officer, I quite unashamedly focused on uh, some of the positive elements uh, of tourism in our nation. But I want to touch upon three of the, the challenges as well. Now, some, some will no doubt uh, raise the issue of the, the transient visitor levy, and it's important that this issue is debated sensibly. The Cabinet Secretary was clear last week when she indicated that it would not be introduced uh, until 2021 at the earliest, as well as local authorities. They will have that choice as to whether to use it or not. Now, I understand that argument, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I understand the argument against it, uh, with VAT being so high. Now, with that being the case, uh, what would the financial impact actually be if VAT were reduced and the levy was brought in? Now, a strong and logical argument could well then be deployed that it actually should be a national levy and not a local power. This would then fly in the face of devolving further responsibilities to local authorities. A second challenge is that of the environment. Now, I've raised this issue with the Scottish Government uh, before regarding some camper van drivers uh, dumping their human waste at the roadside instead of the appropriate sites. Uh, a constituent uh, who first raised this with me actually came back into my office and spoke to me about this issue again yesterday, raised further concerns that he has on this as well as with the caravan club on the matter. Now he has been a caravaner for over 50 years and is angry that some people both from Scotland and elsewhere think it's fine to actually go and dump their human waste illegally instead of paying a nominal fee to keep Scotland clean. And the third challenge is that of Brexit. Now, when someone is respected as the travel writer uh, and author Simon Calder states, the travel industry is in complete disarray. Flights from Edinburgh to Germany for £13 on the 1st of April or a week's package uh, in Malta for £180. Westminster is committing criminal damage against Scottish tourism. Politicians need to listen. Mr Calder stated this comment last week at the STA signature event. Now, in conclusion, presenting officer, I do want to conclude on a positive note, something that we can actually all agree on. Visit Scotland do an excellent job, uh, and they help partner many, many organisations together. They've become uh, such a widely respected international body, and they've shown great leadership in the tourism field. Now, the Scottish Government's themed years have certainly been a boost uh, for them, and I, and I am particularly looking forward to uh, next year, uh, the 2020 year of coasts and waters. I want to say, Happy 50th birthday, everyone at Visit Scotland. Thank you for what you have done and also for what you will continue to do. And here's to the next 50 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. McMillan. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Thank you, presiding officer. Oops. So what the hell I I congratulate my friend and colleague Stuart McMillan on securing this debate. The aim of Scottish Tourism Month is to engage, connect and inspire all of Scotland's tourism businesses and organisations and to celebrate the enormous contribution of our tourism industry to Scotland's economy. And I'd like to commend Stuart McMillan for his in-depth contribution. And it's, uh, it's clear that you have a, a fantastic knowledge of the contribution that tourism brings for marine tourism as well as uh, tourism to the economy of Scotland. Tourism is everyone's business. It's the driving message behind this month-long event, and it is an opportunity for everyone to get involved in networking events and tourism conversations across our country. On Saturday, I attended a Cycling UK Scotland networking event held in Dalbeatty in my South Scotland region as part of their national campaign to engage with community cycling groups across Scotland. The event was attended by Lee Craigie, Scotland's new Active Nation Commissioner and Sally Hinchcliffe, who's founder of Cycling Dumfries, and Jeff Frew, the local Cycling UK coordinator for Dumfries and Galloway. The main subject was how we can improve the cycling infrastructure across South West Scotland to better connect communities and to attract more active travel and active tourism to the area. Active tourism would benefit the local economy. Cycling and walking are key for our region. As members may know, we have many of world-class Seven Stains mountain bike trails, we have numerous on-road cycle routes, and now a new regional BMX track in Newton Stewart for people to enjoy. However, there does exist a need for the road routes, pathways and cycleways, and even the waterways for paddle sports to be better connected. This is something which, following representations from constituents and local organisations, 
I have written to the Scottish Government, Borderlands Growth Deal Officers and Dumfries and Galloway Council about. Presiding officer, across Dumfries and Galloway, we have a rich selection of micro and small food and drink businesses, many of which are known across the region for their excellent quality. Many of these businesses are working together with partners like Visit Scotland and Dumfries and Galloway Food and Drink, managed by Lorna Young. In Dumfries, we have Palmerston Cafe, opened in 1969, offering a range of over 50 different flavours of award-winning ice cream, from traditional favourites like old-fashioned vanilla and some more exotic ones, such as the Ryan Brew, Bubblegum and my favourite Jaffa Cake. Lots of insulin is needed for that one, I can assure you. In Dalbiti, the Galloway Soup Company Cafe makes a wide range of soups using the finest local ingredients and has a shop loaded with other great food and drink from Dumfries and Galloway. In Castle Douglas, in-house chocolates by design, an award-winning local shop offering bespoke chocolate tr treats is also uh, doing great business. In Stranraer, Henry's Bay House restaurant serves Scotland's finest seafood, including the delicious Loch Ryan local oysters. We are also lucky to have the best produce in Scotland. Scotch beef, Scotch lamb, venison, gin, whisky and even Galloway grown chilies made into great hot sauces. Presiding officer, while I don't have time to talk about all the fabulous work across the Friesen Galloway, I would just like to mention some of our world renowned visitor attractions, which I encourage all to visit and enjoy. The Stranraer Oyster Festival, now in its third year, is attracting more visitors to Stranraer with an economic input of around £1 million in 2018. And redevelopment of Stranraer Waterfront is another exciting project getting underway. We have the world famous Wigtown Book Festival, which our First Minister spoke at last year, and the Lumineer Festival in Kirkubri, Dumfries and Kirkubri Farmers Markets, Big Burn Supper, Dark Skies Park, the Galloway and Southern Ayrshire Biosphere. The list is um, endless. In conclusion, I'd like to pay tribute to all the businesses, people and organisations working hard to make the region as attractive as possible to visitors. And I ask the Scottish Government, particularly with the formation of the South Scotland Economic Partnership, ahead of the Enterprise Agency, to ensure that our infrastructure, roads, rail, ferries and everything else, but don't let's forget that active travel, our cyclists and walkers also need the best infrastructure to ensure people come and visit our most bra and bonny corner of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. I call Alexander Burnett to follow by Claire Baker. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I join my colleagues in thanking Stuart Macmillan for bringing this debate on Scottish Tourism Month, coordinated by the Scottish Tourism Alliance. And I'm sure everyone in this chamber will agree that Scotland is one of the most beautiful countries in the world, and we are lucky to call it home. And earlier this month, I was delighted and not unsurprised to see that tourist numbers were up over 5% in the north of Scotland. And the Press and Journal reported that notable visitor increases were seen at various National Trust for Scotland properties, and significant numbers were recorded at distilleries and whisky-related attractions, including Royal Lop Nagar Distillery in my own constituency. And just this week, past weekend, I was up in Orkney and was lucky, lucky enough to visit Scarabray. And catching a moment to read the local weekly paper, The Orcadian, I learned that Historic Environment Scotland has noted that this heritage site have a record-breaking year in 2018 as the sixth most visited in the country, with nearly 112,000 visitors. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, at this point, I'd like to note members to my register of interests in relation to a number of tourism businesses I'm involved with, from promoting local artisans to providing family-friendly accommodation. And tourism is a necessary and welcome part of our sustainable future, as we diversify economically from oil and gas, of which I am proud to play my part. And I'm also proud to be part of Clan Burnet, which has seen many relatives from all over the world encouraged to come and learn about the history of our clan. Ancestral tourism has played an important part in drawing visitors to Scotland, and our clan is no exception. There has been a Burnet gathering at Crathers every four years since 1992, each one seeing a rise in numbers, with 2017 seeing over 200 Burnets visit Deeside from around the world. Now, I'm sure that such a volume of Burnets may not appeal to everyone, uh, but joking aside, clan gatherings have a huge potential for Scottish tourism and I have seen firsthand the benefit it can bring to the local tourism industry. Our own gathering saw those who flocked from afar attend the Aboyne Games, take bus tours around Deeside, visit local National Trust properties, with many going on to other places in Scotland, particularly Edinburgh and the Highlands. 
all resulting in a contribution to Scotland's economy of over a quarter million pounds. Now, the North East continues to build on its tourism successes, and 2020 will see the opening of a £350 million extension of Aberdeen Harbour. And Yvonne Cook from Visit Aberdeenshire noted this would be a game changer, as it will allow ships carrying several thousand people to dock. And this can only result in local tourist attractions boosting their numbers, and businesses across Aberdeenshire are eagerly anticipating the harbour opening. Yeah, seven. What do you want? I thank Alexander Burnett for giving way. Does he agree with me that not everyone wants to come off the ship and immediately get on a bus? And it's important that there are attractions within walking distance of the new harbour at Nick Bay, including in Torrey, in my constituency. Yeah. Alexander Burnett. Yeah, I, I thank Maureen for her intervention. I, I very much agree. And I think uh, it's very important to realise that with so many visitors, uh, not everybody is immediately going to jump on a bus uh, and head up, head up Deeside, though obviously we were hoping many will, uh, but there will be many opportunities and I'm sure people in Aberdeen uh, should be uh, encouraged to, to do as much as they can to encourage them into Aberdeen as elsewhere in, in Aberdeenshire. Um, now, uh, on top of the harbour, uh, we're also seeing the opening of our brand new Aberdeen Exhibition Centre at DICE. Uh, and seeing its impressive size as I flew back from Orkney yesterday, there is no doubt that this will help attract bigger events and offer even more opportunities for businesses to engage. So Scottish Tourism Month aims to bring together and inspire all of Scotland's tourism businesses, and I'm lucky to have seen the benefits collaboration can bring to local communities in the economy. So I've no doubt that Scotland will continue to prosper and flourish, and I look forward to another successful year for Scottish tourism. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Claire Baker, followed by Patrick Harvey. Ms Baker, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. This evening is a good opportunity for the Parliament to recognise and celebrate Scottish Tourism Month. And I congratulate Stuart Macmillan for securing the debate and for his contribution. I would like to recognise the huge amount of organisation and preparation that goes into Scottish Tourism Month and the benefits and opportunities it brings to Scotland's tourist businesses and organisations. Tourism is important to Scotland's economy, involving many businesses and employing people directly and indirectly. Tourists to Scotland generate around £12 billion of economic activity for the wider Scottish supply chain and contributes around £6 billion to the Scottish GDP, representing about 5% of total Scottish GDP. We have seen positive growth in people visiting Scotland, both from across the UK and internationally. We have seen particularly strong growth in visitors from Europe, and the sector is working hard to meet expectations and provide a quality experience. We can see from the breadth of events taking place during Scottish Tourism Month that it is a sector working hard to play to Scotland's strengths and offer unique experiences for the traveller. As Stuart McMillan described, the Marine Tourism Conference is promoting this growth area and looking forward to the 2020 Year of Coasts and Waters. Showcases and conferences such as ScotHot and the Wild Scotland Conference are important opportunities for the sector to network, to collaborate and ensure their businesses remain fresh and relevant. Scotland is doing well, but it is a competitive market and we need to work hard to demonstrate our value. Um, Poseidon Officer, I went to a staycation discussion called Should I Stay or Should I Go? a couple of weeks ago with five college travel and tourism students. Over 70 students from across the campus attended. These students represent the future of the sector and it was great to hear their ideas about what makes Scotland attractive and how to increase the number of people choosing to holiday at home. In comparing Scotland with travelling abroad, of course, the weather was a factor. But the discussion also included um, concerns about improving infrastructure, transport links and developing more tourist cards which would promote multiple discounts and promoting more of this to the home market. These young people were enthusiastic about the sector and they will be an asset to our tourism businesses. Tourism supports jobs across Scotland and is a significant employer in particular parts of the country. The future is unpredictable and until our relationship with the EU is resolved, there are many areas where we don't know what the impact will be on tourism. However, we do know that whatever happens, Scotland will still have a story to tell. Our natural environment, our historic buildings, which are having a renaissance in popularity, helped by the enthusiasm for Outlander, among other things. Our wildlife, our Scottish food and drink sector. These strengths and more will remain, and we need to find ways to support the sector in whatever the change landscape will be. 
There will be a pressure on workforce and skills, and any new migration system must reflect Scotland's needs. But we also need to promote the sector as an attractive career. Charities such as Springboard work to support young people, un unemployed people and disadvantaged groups to pursue a career in tourism and gain new skills. An important part of attracting people into the sector is ensuring good pay and conditions and not allowing exploitative work practices. And the Fairer Hospitality cam Campaign with Unite the Union is doing great work on this. And I also welcome the launch of the Manifesto of Cooks and Chefs aimed at putting good practice at the heart of hospitality. Um, at the weekend, I was at Kirkcaldy's Food and Drink Festival. Organised by Kirkcaldy for All as part of the Adam Smith Festival, it's a good example of businesses, charities, colleges, all working together to promote their town, to showcase its strengths and to celebrate its history. This type of hard work helps promote the area and deliver multiple benefits, including for the tourism and hospitality sector. So this month we are celebrating gives a focus to this kind of collaborative working which is so important to the sector, which is increasingly serving tourists who are choosing to come to Scotland for an experience they can't get anywhere else. So I would like to wish Scottish Tourism a successful month and look forward to a positive future. Thank you very much. I call Patrick Harvey, followed by Liam MacArthur. Mr Harvey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I uh, also congratulate Stuart McMillan for bringing the debate to the Chamber. And uh, I think, uh, as he said, there will be aspects of this debate which grain uh, complete consensus across the chamber about the pride that we have in the country that we live in and the, the joy that it gives to people who live here to share uh, what's great about Scotland with people who come to visit. Uh, whether that's in relation to uh, you know, older traditions around uh, uh, what was it, heather and, and golf and whiskey, uh, or indeed uh, some of the newer aspects in the food and drink strategy, for example, looking to grow uh, our brewing uh, tradition. Uh, there, there are people who will travel far and wide uh, for excellent beer, uh, and Scotland should be proud of what it's producing there as well. And as, as Claire Baker says, if, um, if we do see a, a continued success in the sector, that really will strip away any justification uh, that some operators have for continuing to pay below the living wage or using ex exploitative uh, terms of contracts. We should be proud of a, a thriving and successful tourism sector that treats all of its workforce with the respect that they deserve. There are also, as Stuart McMillan was right to point out, some challenges that we need to debate honestly. Uh, and in particular, my colleague uh, Andy Whiteman has been working hard to, to say that there are good and bad practices in terms of accommodation, particularly in a place like Edinburgh. Uh, and the work that Andy has done on short-term lets uh, really does offer us the opportunity to distinguish between good and bad practice. We can have great quality tourism, uh, including the accommodation that that's required, without having uh, some of the negative consequences that that's created in some communities. Uh, one, uh, one Edinburgh resident who wrote to Andy um, at the start of his campaign said, I live in a tenement block in Edinburgh. When I moved into my flat, there was a mixture of residents, old and young, single people and families with kids. Many were owner-occupiers while others rented. Now on my floor, the two other flats are run as short-term lets. One is a short-term let all year round. It's a residential flat purchased purely for commercial purposes. And if we see more and more uh, residential accommodation, uh, part of our community fabric in places in both urban and rural Scotland turned over to short-term letting businesses, that will come with consequences which are not good for the places that we live in. We don't want to turn uh, Scotland into a lowest common denominator tourism offering. We want to maintain strong, vibrant, enjoyable communities. That's the kind of place that people want to continue to visit, want to return to. And if people feel that they're not visiting those kind of communities that are being well looked after, I fear that they wouldn't return. There are other issues, and, and Stuart McMillan mentioned the, the issue of, of taxation. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what he was talking about by turning the, the transient visitor levy into a, a national proposal. That, to me, would undermine the core purpose of it. VAT, for example, does not go to fund our local councils. Uh, local councils invest in things like streets, pavements, the, the urban environment, uh, the, the built environment, uh, 
just something as basic as having toilet facilities, which Highland Council in particular were keen to stress. That's really important for the quality of the experience that tourists have when they come to visit. So giving local councils the ability to raise revenue locally is a critically important part of maintaining an attractive place that people will want to return to and visit again. I give way. Stuart McMillan. I uh, thank Patrick Harvey for, uh, for taking the intervention. It's, I'm sure that Mr Harvey, uh, when you look at the, uh, Mr Harvey looks at the official report, that wasn't what I was arguing for. I was just highlighting the, the fact that some people, if they were to argue for a reduction in VAT, then if there were to be, uh, some people could argue, uh, but I, I disagree with, but some people could argue that actually uh, the scheme should then become a national scheme as compared to a local scheme. Patrick Harvey. I apologise if, if I misunderstood the point. I, I, I think we do have a commitment that what will be consulted on is a locally determined tax, uh, and I look forward to the government uh, continuing to commit to that. And finally, presiding officer, other longer-term challenges that Scotland is going to have to face include, as uh, Mr Burnett mentioned, the, the diversification of our economy away from oil and gas. We are, not just Scotland, but globally, facing a crisis of our very survival. Moving from oil and gas extraction into an economy that is still dependent on ever greater levels of aviation is not a solution to that. And so we need to be doing what we can to make sure that people have good, affordable, accessible opportunities to come and visit Scotland by surface routes. And at the moment, for example, the idea of uh, a, a big tax cut through uh, air passenger duty or the, uh, the air departure tax would give a huge subsidy to local flights within the UK. A huge proportion of that tax cut would be subsidising unnecessary short-haul aviation, which is not something that we can afford uh, to continue uh, to see grow. And so I would, I would finally just also uh, commend the work that we've done uh, on the, the case for an aviation tax which actually limits the environmental damage because unless we look after the environment uh, which is the foundation of what makes Scotland such an attractive place to visit, uh, then we, we may see short-term growth, but long-term decline, and that's not something any of us should welcome. Thank you, Liam MacArthur, followed by Julian Martin. Uh, thank you, Deputy <laughs> President Officer. Can I, too, um, join others in thanking and congratulating Stuart McMillan on securing a debate on a, a sector that does genuinely touch and have an impact on every uh, corner of the country. I think Mr McMillan and I uh, enjoy a good-natured uh, rivalry over whose uh, constituency uh, attracts most uh, cruise liners over the course of a, a season. I think Orkney's set to have 164 liners this year, so I'm quietly confident uh, that we may still have the upper hand. This is not, though, uh, without its challenges, and I'll come to some of those shortly, but I think uh, it's worth emphasising that the growth in tourism we've seen is something that certainly Orkney is benefiting from, as indeed our communities across the country and Scotland uh, as a whole. After Alexander Burnett's um, earlier spoiler alert, I can confirm that tourism in, in Orkney is on uh, the up. The statistics from Visit Scotland suggest a 22% increase in visitor numbers between 2013 and 17, uh, up to around 340,000, uh, with an average spend up over that period as well, and a, a, an overall contribution to the Orkney economy of around 50 uh, million by 2017. Not bad at all for a community of 21,000. This is a success story, a success story uh, that has not gone uh, unnoticed. A decade ago, I, I remember um, uh, referring to the, uh, the, the reference in, uh, in uh, this parliament uh, to something the Lonely Planet had said, suggesting that Orkney is the glittering centrepiece of Scotland's treasure chest of attractions. Uh, the shine has not come off that centrepiece in the intervening years. Uh, Orkney was voted best place to live by the Al Halifax survey in 2019. Kirkwall was voted uh, top of the stops by passengers in the prestigious uh, Viking cruises. Uh, for North Europe and Scandinavia, uh, and uh, Orkney was runner-up in Country Files Best UK Holiday Destination 2019, and we have, of course, asked for a recount in that particular context. But I think it reflects the growing reputation uh, of Orkney as a quality destination, and that is important. It's not just a numbers game. It has to be about the quality and the sustainability of what we offer. Orkney has, I would say, um, natural assets in terms of its stunning landscapes and marine environment internationally renowned UNESCO sites, world-class food and drink, hugely creative arts and crafts sector, and the list goes on. Uh, but we've found a way of harnessing that, and I pay tribute uh, to the Orkney Gateway uh, project, and it's testament to the efforts 
the vision, the collaboration of many uh, partners, Destination Orkney, the Council, Visit Scotland and many more besides. Uh, with uh, upcoming Year of Coasts and Waters in 2020, Year of Scotland Stories in 2022, both I think playing very much to Orkney's strengths. I'm also delighted that Orkney is due to host the International Island Games in 2023 as well. Again, another opportunity to showcase what Orkney has uh, to offer. But I think Stuart McMillan, Patrick Harvey and others were right uh, to enter a note of caution. We cannot be complacent about this uh, or, as I say, uh, simply rest on a numbers game. I think that success has come with many challenges. It will require more active management of tourists coming to Orkney, uh, taking pressure some off some of the more busy sites and making better use of the wider assets that we have. Uh, Key to that will be our internal transport links and in particular the replacement of our uh, ageing internal ferry fleet operating between the smaller uh, aisles and I think that's something the Scottish Government will need to step up to the plate on. Likewise on road equivalent tariff, Orkney and Shetland routes um, require that to be implemented, not just in the interest of fairness uh, but also uh, in the tourism sense to remain uh, competitive. Uh, I've already said Visit Scotland, I think, have made real strides, but there's more I think they can be doing in the dispersal of tourists from the central belt, promoting regions uh, and uh, promoting the diversity of the product that Scotland has to offer. Uh, we have in, in Orkney world-class heritage sites, if I, as I've said, but still not yet world-class infrastructure to support that. And I think Historic Environment Scotland needs to keep working with local partners to deliver this over the coming years. In Scottish Tourism uh, Month, it's right we recognise and celebrate our successes and what we have to offer. Uh, but given the importance of this success, not sector, not just to Orkney, but to all parts of Scotland, we cannot be complacent, we cannot rest on our laure laurels. And this is an opportunity during uh, Tourism uh, Month to remind ourselves of that. Uh, but with that, can I thank Stuart McMillan once again and wish all those working in the, in the sector a highly successful 2019 season. Thank you. Thank you. I still have four members uh, wishing to take part in the debate, so due to that, uh, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. So I would invite Stuart McMillan to move a motion without notice. From the move, presenting officer. The question is the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. I call Julian Martin to be followed by Tom Mason. Thank you, President Officer. I also want to put on record my thanks to Stuart McMillan for securing this debate and also my thanks to him for mentioning Scotland's most easterly distillery in my constituency. Um, I think I might have to bring you another bottle. Down, down the road. Um, I've, I've spoken uh, before um, a, a lot, quite a lot about uh, the part that Aberdeenshire plays in our tourism offer and last year I used this opportunity to, to highlight the literary and cultural tour that you could do in Aberdeenshire East if you were so minded. But this year I specifically like to talk about Aberdeenshire's long-standing uh, environmental and nature tourism offer which has the potential to really take off given the right support. Um, so first off I'm going to go to my personal happy place and that is Newbury Beach and Farvey Reserve. The reserve is home to a myriad of coastal bird species and has long been the twitcher destination of choice in the northeast. People come from all over the UK to watch birds. But uh, in the last 10 years, the north side of the mouth of the River Ithan has become the resting point of the largest grey seal colony in the whole of the UK. And we've seen a, a great surge in the amount of people coming to Newborough just for that reason of, of seeing the seals. Now, I'm currently working with residents of Newborough to assist them in improving the visitor access to the beach and resurface the car park, which has been in a, a state, actually, for as long as I can remember. Um, and Again, there's an issue there about infrastructure. I take on uh, what, what Liam MacArthur was saying about infrastructure. Often some of the roads and tracks leading to these areas of natural beauty, they're, they're not managed by the council. So they, become, they fall into disrepair and, and local community groups can find, find it quite difficult to, to uh, maintain these routes. That's certainly the case in, in Newborough, but we're hopeful. We also particularly want to make the, the beach more accessible to people in wheelchairs as well um, and to people whose mobility isn't what it maybe was when they were younger who've enjoyed that, uh, that, that, that experience in the younger days um, and, and should be able to continue offering it. So um, we want to ensure great access to the South Shore is the best place to view the colony 
Um, and I've met people from all over the world who are making a detour from the more obvious tourist spots that Alexander Burnett has mentioned in the west of Aberdeenshire, like Bramar, the Royal Deeside uh, Trail, um, which, which I think people automatically associate Aberdeenshire with. Um, but people are actually drifting towards the east to come and visit, just specifically to visit our seals. Uh, and two summers ago, we gained more fans as a humpback whale and her calf came into the estuary at low tide to feed over a period of two months. So it became the whale destination of the northeast as well. But I agree with Maureen Watt that there's, there's, there's so much more to Aberdeenshire um, than, than the west, as beautiful as it is. It's a very well-known area, but I'm, I'm really hopeful that the redevelopment of the Peterhead Harbour um, uh, we'll be accommodating cruise ships and it's a huge opportunity for ecotourism in my area uh, as well as Stuart Stevenson's. Um, just along the coast from Newburgh we've got Hackley Bay, Colliston and Winifold who have caught, they've got colonies of puffins nesting around this time of year to add to our many seabird populations and sightings of dolphins uh, um, are, are not uncommon although uh, Maureen Watts um, constituency Tory's got the best place to, to visit and, and I, I congratulate RSPB and the work that they're doing with Dolphin Watch there. But off the back of this coastal tourism offer we've got lots of biz businesses that have sprung up and it leads me on to the theme of the tourism event that I led along with Visit Scotland in Fivey Castle last July where we spent a day talking about agri-tourism. Um, as a huge emerging market for agri-tourism um, and experience type holidays. Um, it, we heard from experts in the field effectively just talking about holidays, literally in a field. Um, we heard of farmers often farm holidays, we're helping out the farms part of the experience. Um, it's a great thing for young families to do. Um, what better than your kids spending a weekend feeding lambs, collecting eggs and getting out and about in an environment that they may not have ready access to. But before I sit down beside an officer, I'd like to mention a, a family that have really grab the experience, uh, uh, tourism, eco-experience, and that's the same family who have set up uh, one of the, the few uh, gin distilleries that actually make gin from scratch and they make it using local, um, uh, locally sourced materials, and they're going to be expanding their business to include glamping, um, as well as tours around all our many stone circles that we have in Aberdeenshire. People are absolutely grabbing this idea of experience agri-tourism in my area, and I used to always say that uh, Aberdeenshire East is the best kept secret, but I think that I won't be saying that for much longer if people can continue at this pace. Thank you very much. I call Tom Mason, be followed by Jackie Bailey. <coughs> Mr. Mason. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thanks to Stuart McMillan for giving us the opportunity to, to debate this today. The Scottish tourist industry is one of the most important sectors of our economy, not just in terms of jobs and revenue raised here, but also in promotion of Scotland overseas. With that in mind, I am pleased to join colleagues in welcoming the Scottish Tourist Month. Across the country, the positive impact of tourism for our economy is clear to see. 8% of all Scottish businesses are involved in tourism, generating almost four billion in gross value added every year. We outperform the rest of the UK in attracting tourists, with Edinburgh being the top UK destin destination outside London. Not only that, but Scotland was voted the most beautiful and most welcoming country in the world in 2017 by the Rough Guide. Frankly, it is very easy to see why that is the case. These are all remarkable feats and certainly worthy of celebration here in the Parliament and beyond. Now, in my region, we have a wide variety of tourist attractions that are great for bringing people to the northeast. Visit Aberdeenshire has pointed out that in their area alone we have five ski centres, eight distilleries, 55 golf courses and 263 castles, not mentioning Royal Deeside and of course the Cairn Gordon National Park. No, what a, no matter what takes your fancy, we've got it all. And of course as an Aberdeen local councillor I must point to the sense of new, some of the new facilities that have been either just been finished or we're about to or about to be. A refurbished music hall, a refurnished and extended art gallery, a brand new 6,000 seat exhibition centre, achieved with little, help, little central government support, and a harbour redevelopment that will enable the largest cruise ships to dock, allowing people from across the world to experience the best of our hospitality. Now, speaking of excellent art exhibitions and festivals, I would, of course, mention New Art, an international 
International Public Street and Art Festival that was recently voted Best Cultural Event at Aberdeen City and Shower Tourism Awards. And if you are quick, then tickets are also available at the Jazz Festival ne next week. I do have fear, however, that our friends in Dundee may be able to top that with the new Victoria and Albert Museum. This has been nothing short of transformational for the city, and I urge colleagues who have not yet visited to do so as a matter of haste. All things considered, it is a great that we have events like the Scottish Tourism Month, which is great for celebrating the successes we have seen, and also for assessing the challenges ahead working on how best to support the industry in the future. In terms of the work we do here, Deputy Presiding Officer, the main issue that tourism organisers raise with me is the prospect of a transient visitor levy or tourist tax. I must say that I have my doubts about whether or not it would be the correct approach for the North East. However, there is still some road to travel in this respect. I'm sure we will not be alone in keeping a very close eye on progress here in the months to come. With that said, Deputy Presiding Officer, we have a great deal to celebrate in our tourism industry, and I'm delighted to be able to do so today. Scottish Tourism Month is a great venture that I will, I, I hope, focus our minds on how to put, put our tourism organisations in the best circumstances to succeed in the months and years ahead. So I wish everybody involved well and look forward to seeing the progress that they are working so hard to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr McGregor is the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Bailey, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and let me join with others in thanking Stuart McMillan for bringing this to the Chamber. I have no whisky for him, but it does indeed give me an excuse to talk about my beautiful constituency, not that I need much of an excuse. Um, my constituency, as members know, includes Loch Lomond. It includes that well-known seaside town on the Clyde, Helensburgh, the Arica Alps, Dumbarton Castle, and so much more. And I invite you all to visit, in particular, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, whether visitors are seeking nature, historical sites, cultural events, or even thrill-seeking adventures, I think we punch above our weight. And yes, we have whiskey too, and award-winning breweries. For those seeking history, Dumbarton Castle has the longest recorded history of any stronghold in Scotland. Built on a volcanic plug, that was formed hundreds of millions of years ago. Overlooking the Clyde, the castle is a sight to see and dominates the vista. In fact, I always used to say um, to Stuart Macmillan's predecessor, Duncan McNeil, that he had the better view because he managed to look across at my constituency. Um, the Martin Castle is, of course, home to several famous and important figures such as Mary, Queen of Scots, the wizard Merlin, and, of course, Napoleon Bonaparte. Bet you didn't know this. Narrowly avoided being exiled to Dumbarton Castle, preferring Elba instead. I can't imagine why, presiding officer. But let me turn to another major historical figure, and that's Robert the Bruce. And let me commend the campaign run by my local newspaper, the Lennox Herald, to recognize the contribution that Robert the Bruce made to shaping Scotland, and indeed Dumbarton. Given that he lived some of his life in Renton and Cardras, and St. Serf's Church is one of the burial sites for his remains, it makes sense for him to be commemorated here. And I hope to engage the Cabinet Secretary in a discussion about how the Scottish Government could help that development in my local area. And of course, there is Loch Lomond, the largest loch in the UK by surface area, the second largest by volume. Um, it is just such a tremendous, peaceful place. But if you're seeking some excitement, there are boating and water sports available, kayaking, water skiing, the great Scottish swim in August. It's a bit cold, presiding officer, but I do recommend it. If you prefer something a bit more sedate, we have the restoration of the Maid of the Loch and award-winning cruises on the loch by Sweeney's Cruises, Cruise Loch Lomond, um, and it is just tremendous. And of course, if you prefer climbing to the water, we have the Arica Alps um, and Highland Games in Bala, Helensburgh, um, Last Rose Neath, you name it, we've got it. And if you want to get away from it all, we have several high-quality hotels that I would recommend to my colleagues. The award-winning Not Dairy Country House Hotel, built around 1846 as a summer retreat, is now a picturesque hotel overlooking Loch Long 
and the Argyleshire Hills. And there are many others too. And indeed, Patrick Harvey is a former local, I'm sure, would add to that list. Uh, Patrick absolutely. Harvey. And thank you very much. And, and um, rather than recommending the, uh, the caves around the back of Dumbarton Rock as a, as a favourite bunking off spot when I was a kid, uh, I, I'm surprised Jackie Bailey hasn't mentioned one of my favourite tourist attractions, uh, the number of people who come uh, to her constituency, to the Faz Lane blockades, <laughs> from right across Europe and far beyond. Uh, will, will Jackie Bailey uh, join me in welcoming that kind of continued repeat tourism that her constituency gains from? <laughs> Jackie absolutely. Bailey. Absolutely not, presiding officer. Not least because they come, they block the roads, they get arrested, they spend no money in the area, and they cause disruption for the genuine tourists who want to experience um, the, the beauty of my constituency. Um, let, me, let me press on, presiding officer, because of course much of my area is covered by Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park. Um, the scenery is beautiful, it's breathtaking. And if you needed further proof, the numbers of tourists are increasing. Everybody from day trippers to weekend visitors and to those passing through on their journey up to the north. They come from Glasgow, Edinburgh and beyond. They come from all parts of Europe, Spain, Portugal, France and Germany. They come from America and increasingly they come in very huge coach loads from China too. We live in a beautiful country. I am pleased that others come to enjoy and experience our culture and our history. They spend money when they're doing so. They contribute importantly to our economy. We should welcome them and we should make sure that we keep them coming in the future. So can I finish by thanking um, the Scottish Tourism Alliance for their efforts in organising this month of tourism and hope that we continue to see many more visitors to come. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Call Paul to McGregor. Um, thank you, President Officer, and I want to also uh, thank Stuart McMillan for bringing this debate in Scottish Tourism Month to the, to the Chamber. And I'll start by associating myself with uh, Jackie Bailey's um, speech there, or most of her speech, apart from fast lane comments, perhaps. But um, I, I, as, a, as a city boy just outside Glasgow myself, uh, Luss has been a, always a, a tourist spot for me. My, my brother actually got married there last year, and it was a, a beautiful setting for him to, to get married in. But I'm here to talk about my own constituency. I wasn't actually planning to speak, presiding officer. And I, I know folk around the chamber will be thinking, Cope Bridge and Christen isn't, uh, isn't naturally where you might think about for, uh, for tourism, but as the, the local MSP, I feel that it's my job to perhaps change some people's minds on that. And um, I also, I can't give uh, other MSPs the opportunity to have the, the shameless promotion of their own constituencies that they've had without reply. Um, so, I mean, when people think about Cope Bridge and maybe Lanarkshire more generally, they think of a, a, a strong industrial past. So, if you're looking for something to learn about the industrial past of Scotland, visit Summerlee Heritage Museum, it's run by Culture NL, an absolutely fantastic facility where you can go down a, a, a real mine, you can ride on a real tram, and I, I mean a real tram by one from the past, or you can take a walk on the Vulcan, which is... Um, docked on the, the, the old Monkland Canal and much, much more, and it's great for kids and adults alike. We've also, of course, got the, the time capsule. Uh, it's, it's quote is half ice, half water, a whole lot of fun. Um, with, with my own wee boy, we, we, we use the water park uh, fairly regularly. There was recently um, uh, some worry that, that, that its future might be in jeopardy, but a, a, a very strongly supported online petition has made sure that um, that this speculation has been put to an end, at least for now. And while I'd like to see it going back to its, its glory days and been open um, right throughout the week um, and been more accessible in that, uh, in that respect, I'm glad that it is still open at weekends and on school holidays. And I would recommend Saturday uh, and Sunday nights when it's a wee bit quieter if, you're, if anybody's planning to come along. Although if you like, you're what feel absolutely mobbed then uh, weekends during the day. Um, are, are your best choice. Um, outdoors uh, in the area, you can go to Drumpilga Park, which is um, part of the fabulous Seven uh, Locks Wetland Project, which uh, has, has really worked hard at involving uh, a lot of youngsters and local schools into um, getting the benefits of outdoor learning and outdoor play. You can cycle, walk, uh, running groups, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and and it's, uh, there's also boating on the lock as well in the, in the summer months. There's real lots to do. Uh, and it's great to have such something like that in which what's mainly a very uh, urban 
um, constituency. And on the same vein, Gap College Nature Reserve, pretty, pretty nearby. Um, it's actually a, a, an important site for a protected species, the, the, the Great Crested Newt uh, colony. It's the largest colony in Scotland, and it's very relaxed in the area, but uh, kids from the local schools and, and groups can go out and learn about uh, the Great Crested Newt and, and what it actually does to the ecosystem and, and the environment, uh, its existence and being there. So, presiding officer, these are just a few uh, of the... Uh, the, the things in Coatbridge and Christen, and uh, you know, it's, it's actually a fabulous area to visit, and, uh, and probably doesn't get the, the the credit it deserves. We've got lots of good food places as well. The Mad Batters Bakery uh, would be one example. The the Inn and the Lock, um, the, you know, the, the coffee shop at, at Sunnyside Station. There's lots and lots to do, and you can actually spend the whole day there. Um, I've just been at Sky with the committee all over Scotland. We've got absolutely fabulous things. And I think that every single constituency and regional MSP can stand up here and talk for minutes and minutes um, about this. But I think it's been a great debate. I didn't plan to speak, and I, I'm glad I've taken the opportunity. And I just want to finish on, uh, since it's the, the, the minister summing up, uh, I tweeted her a, a couple of months ago there, because my constituency is not too, not too far from our own, uh, when we were looking for a wee adventure uh, one day, my, myself and, uh, and my five-year-old, and we went out and we found uh, Blowhorn Moss, what a hidden wee gem that is if your MD's looking for outdoor, uh, you know, something outdoor, outdoor nature, run by the Scottish National Heritage. Absolutely brilliant. I thought I'd mention it since the, the minister's summing up. And thank you very much. Thank you. And after a tour around most of Scotland, Cabinet Secretary, I ask you to close for the government, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to thank members for the contributions this afternoon for Stuart McMillan for bringing the debate. Uh, this debate and the many activities taking place uh, throughout Scottish Tourism Month, uh, which I and other ministers have attended, have really highlighted to me the passion that exists for the country's tourism sector, and I'm pleased to hear about members own activities in supporting this month. Tourism really is everyone's business and is everywhere, uh, including, as we've just heard, Fulton McGregor's uh, constituency in the Central Belt. And uh, uh, the, the, his boundary uh, with my constituency also shows that you can have nature reserves and nature uh, places to visit right in the centre of Scotland. It doesn't always have to be in the rural areas that we recognise. The debate today very much uh, reflects themes at the forefront of the Scottish Government's approach to the visitor economy, uh, delivering a successful tourism sector, enhancing Scotland's international reputation and looking to opportunities for the future. Scottish tourism has been doing well. The number of international visitors is growing strongly at a time when numbers for the rest of the UK have been decreasing. Uh, to help cope with the increasing tourist numbers across Scotland, we've allocated £3.6 million uh, to the first 21 successful projects supported by our Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund, improving facilities in communities throughout rural Scotland. Um, as Tom Mason pointed out, we saw the opening of the world-class v &A Dundee, which has contributed to significant increases in footfall at other visitor attractions in Dundee as well in the surrounding region. Last month, the First Minister announced our support for the Andrew Fairley Scholarships, which will provide a fabulous opportunity for two young chefs to further their careers, a further boost to our food and drink sector following the publication last August of the Food and Drink Tourism Action Plan. This is a key component of our tourism sector, our brand founded on provenance uh, and heritage, uh, including Robert the Bruce, as mentioned uh, by Jackie Bailey, uh, is increasingly recognised at home and abroad. Uh, Alex Alexander Burnett uh, should be aware of the Scottish Clan Fund uh, to support the tourism uh, opportunities of clan and historical societies. I announced the, the latest funding round for that, along with the Hoyick Reavers uh, just last week. Um, Gillian Martin talked of uh, tourists visiting Aberdeenshire for nature and beauty and of the new Burris Seals, uh, and I'm speaking at the Visit Aberdeenshire event tomorrow morning um, as part of the Scottish Tourism Month. I'm not sure if I can get glamping with gin in, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, the global public's appetite for our fantastic uh, produce is growing every year, and Scotland's food and drink is now worth £14 billion, testament to the passion, dedication and entrepreneurship of the thousands of people working across the industry. And Emma Harper uh, shone the spotlight on the south of Scotland's a fantastic natural larder. 
Uh, whilst we welcome a success, uh, the tourism sector is fragile and we cannot be complacent. Uh, the international market is incredibly competitive and we must continue to work extremely hard to draw visitors to Scotland and ensure they have an outstanding experience when they're here. Patrick Harvey referred to uh, diversification of business, um, to tourism, and we've heard about agricultural tourism and agritourism as part of that growing experiential uh, drive in tourism. Liam MacArthur talked about the competitiveness of the cruise market and again of the need for sustainability, which we're very conscious of. Yes, visitor uh, spend grew by more than 3% last year, but this is not commensurate at all with the growth in visitor numbers, which means that visitors are actually spending less when they're here. So trying to encourage tourism uh, and tourists that will spend in the appropriate places and the appropriate ways is actually a very important part of how we market and how we um, attract uh, visitors to this country. Rising costs um, to businesses will have exceeded that 3% in some cases. So there really is uh, real pressure in the industry. Um, so it remains a challenge and the impressive headline figures mask uh, some of the underlying pressures that Scotland's businesses are facing in trying to remain competitive. Uh, perhaps the, the biggest issue facing Scotland is continuing to access labour under freedom of movement. In the year to June 2018, it was estimated that the Scottish tourism sector employed 21,000 uh, EU nationals, accounting for 11.6% of employment in the sector. And the Independent Expert Advisory Group on Migration and Population has cre clearly outlined the harm that the UK government proposals would have on Scotland, potentially reducing net migration by up to 50% in the coming decades, uh, jeopardising Scotland's economy, public service, and future, future population growth. So we're very clear that freedom of movement has enriched Scotland and must be allowed to continue, uh, but it's really important for the tourism sector in particular. Uh, the sector needs our support. Um, I'm deeply committed to this and to enabling it to maximise its success, cope with those challenges and thrive in the future. As Claire Baker pointed out, it's also vital that the sector continues to have the skills necessary to provide a high quality tourism product that gives Scotland that competitive edge. The industry, in partnership with Skills Development Scotland, is already committed to bridging the skills gap and encouraging new entrants through the Tourism Skills Investment Plan, through which over 2,700 modern apprenticeships, new starts, were delivered within the sector in 2017-18. So we're encouraging these new entrants to see tourism as a career of choice with rewarding opportunities and we're championing this as a commitment within our programme for government. And it's important that those careers should be built on a culture of fair work, again, I think referenced by um, Patrick Harvey, and we've committed to increasing the number of workers being paid a living wage, and we welcome the support of the tourism sector in achieving this. We've been sensitive to the needs of our regions, in particular the south of Scotland, where we're establishing a new enterprise agency and supporting the region through a dedicated marketing campaign and investment in infrastructure. Our themed years have been a great success in driving collaboration. The year of coasts and waters next year will showcase the many and varied water-based opportunities across the mainland and our, on our islands and a great opportunity for marine tu tourism as so ably championed by Stuart McMillan in this parliament. The creation of the new national tourism strategy is well underway uh, and we'll look at the new and exciting tourism trends that are emerging uh, and what Scotland can offer the world in terms of unique and world-class experiences. And finally, building on the incredible success of the European Championships, yes, in 2023, we'll have the International Island Games uh, in, in Orkney, and we're bringing the UCI uh, World Cycling Champions also to Scotland in 2023. And this will be the first time ever that 13 uh, cycling disciplines have been brought together at the same time in one country, affording us the opportunity to use a prestigious major event to promote Scotland and also sustainable transport, active lifestyles, our environment and our economy. So as we plan uh, for the future of Tourism Presiding Officer and the challenges that it will bring, it is vital that we continue to engage and face these together with the tourism industry. The coming year will bring opportunities. We need to grasp these, show the world that Scotland remains an open and welcoming nation. And it is through the passion and the dedication of those who work in the sector that it thrives. But it is only by working together that we can ensure its future success. Thank you and I commend the motion. Uh, thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.